Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Don Garcia. I'm the incoming president for AIPG for 2023. And Mark Schaff is actually going to be our moderator today. And I can see him moving around on his screen. So I know he's getting his audio visuals together. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. As Don Garcia just said, uh, another town hall with AIPG. Uh, today, we have Nate Stevens joining us. And uh, Nate did an undergraduate degree at Boston College a few years back, maybe a few more than a few, and then uh, went on to Orono University of Maine for a master's in hydrogeology. Currently, uh, Nate is a principal hydrogeologist with Kleinfelder in the Westboro Mass office. And uh, his primary role is providing technical support for internal and external clients. And I'm um, often in touch with Nate. He does a great, uh, great job in that role. Uh, especially, uh, you know, with, with all of the, uh, the different things that are going on in the, in the industry. Uh, he has over 20 years experience in site assessment and remediation, including work throughout the U.S. and in Canada and Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, he's a member of AIPG and also the National Groundwater Association and the Interstate Technology Regulatory Council. And he's a certified professional geologist in New Hampshire and Maine. So welcome, Nate, and uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, support AIPG with the Town Hall. We look forward to your presentation related to the PFOS, or at least some of them. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, welcome, everybody. Glad to see great attendance. Hopefully, the presentation lives up to ex expectations. Um, as the title says, we're going to discuss some PFOS in the subsurface, uh, really with a focus sort of on the intersection of the chemical fate and transport and the regulatory environment and sort of some best practices for assessment and characterization of these compounds. So we'll look at the chemical basics, which may be familiar to some and, and new to others. As I said, we'll talk about the regulatory setting, which is a little bit dynamic right now, both in terms of uh, the amount of investigation the amount of orders coming out from various regulatory agencies, um, right down to the standards that are being set for these compounds in the environment. We'll look at how the chemistry of PFAS or some PFAS uh, control their reactions and their fate and transport in the subsurface, and also look at physical controls exerted by the aquifers themselves and what the resultant behavior is from the intersection of those things. So a few chemical basics um, over the last 20 years or so since these compounds have been in the regulatory crosshairs to some extent, there's been changing terminology and that has somewhat settled. So PFAS in general stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Depending on which source you consult, there's anywhere from 4,000 to 7,500 or so of these. And we're looking at a particular subset. So the most regulated or the most uniformly regulated are two sets of compounds. We have the perfluoral alkyl carboxylic acids, or their carboxylates in their, in their um, solid form, and the perfluoroalkane sulfonic acids. Now in both cases, these compounds, which number a few dozen, consist of a chain of carbon atoms, with some sort of a functional end group, and we're going to talk more about what that means and, and, and what it looks like. And that end group usually is made up of a carboxylate or a sulfonate, hence the, the names on these two groupings. And then the remainder of the carbon chain, which may be a linear chain or maybe a branched chain, is covered with fluorine atoms. And the combination of that functional end group with a chain of carbon and fluorine atoms has important implications for behavior. Importantly, what we're not talking about right now are all the other compounds that exist in the PFAS family, some of which are starting to get more attention placed on them. For instance, certain fluorotelomer substances that have been developed to replace these older PFCAs and PFSAs in certain applications and in some cases actually may serve as sources for these regulated compounds. So let's look in a little more detail at 
one of the uh, more important PFAS compounds that we deal with, in this case, perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, so the dissociated um, version of PFAS, which would exist as a, as a sulfonate in solid form. And as I mentioned, we have some key characteristics that are really important for how these things behave in the subsurface. At one end, along the carbon chain, we have very strong bonds between fluorine and carbon atoms. Those are some of the chemically most stable bonds that can be found man-made or, or in nature. And those are assembled in a tail, which has two properties. One, it tends to be hydrophobic. So in the presence of water, it tends to orient itself away to some other phase, whether that be, um, in some cases, solids or non-aqueous phase liquids or air. Then at the other end, we have this functional end. In this case, it's a sulfonate end, so it has a sulfur atom surrounded by oxygen and then a, a loose hydrogen hanging off the, uh, off the functional head. Now, the net effect of this is that this hydrophobic stable tail and this functional head that does want to try to interact with its environment a little more also acts as a, as a polar compound. There's a charge imbalance. So we have tend to have a more positive charge on the tail end and a more negative charge on the head end. And because of that, it adds another mechanism by which PFAS can interact with the environment, particularly in the subsurface. So these carbon and fluorine chains make these molecules very useful. They're stable under a wide range of conditions, including changes in temperature that can be rather extreme. But because of that stability, they also tend to be less biodegradable than some of the other contaminants that folks who are in consulting or assessment and remediation may deal with. Um, these aren't going to break down in the same way that petroleum hydrocarbons may or that some chlorinated hydrocarbons may in certain instances. And with the stability and the lack of biodegradation in most cases, although there's current studies being undertaken to see if individual PFAS compounds may have some susceptibility to degradation, but in general these tend to accumulate both in the environment and in living things. Now, while that chain makes it stable and hard to degrade, the functional end, again, that sulfonate or that carboxylate, makes these molecules act as surfactants. They, they would like to bridge interfaces. They want to be in water and air, or water and soil, or water, again, in, a, in an apple. The functional end can also cause them to act uh, amphiphilically so that they um, have a particular attraction to certain organic compounds. And the combination of these behaviors make PFAS subject to partitioning once they're in the subsurface. So we have two examples of a, of a longer, two long chain um, PFAS compounds, an undecanoic acid, so 11 carbons, and then uh, down to a four carbon, a butane sulfonic acid. And most of the terminology around this group of PFAS is based on calling them PERS because all their um, carbon spots are connected to fluorines or the functional group, and then referring to the functional end, so the carboxylate or the sulfonate. Now, ITRC, uh, which has put a lot of work into trying to sort of standardize the state of the industry in terms of understanding these compounds, at least the regulated ones, have offered up a uh, classification of these compounds based on, based on both the functional groups and the length of the chain. And one thing to just point out is that whether a PFAS compound is considered short chain or long chain varies whether you're talking about the carboxylates or the sulfonates. So the, the short chain carboxylates run all the way up to seven carbon atoms. So the heptanoic or heptaoic acid and the long chains are eight and above, so your PFOA is a long chain, been in the news, obviously. And then for the sulfonates, short chains are only the four and five carbon compounds. We don't deal with a ton of the terminology in this talk, but just something to keep in mind that they are referring to different length compounds when you are dealing with them in industry. So between usefulness, which resulted in widespread manufacturing 
or use of these compounds sometimes as an adjunct to manufacturing other compounds. And because of their stab stability and because of their lack of biodegradability, uh, these PFAS compounds are found worldwide. We have measured precipitation, concentrations in precipitation, as well as in dry atmospheric deposition, so in dusts that are settling out of the atmosphere under certain conditions. We find them obviously in drinking water and that drives a lot of both the regulatory um, focus on them as well as in fact the newsworthiness of them. Um, normally PFAS in the news are there because they were found in a drinking water supply and, and therefore people may be exposed to them directly. Almost as importantly in terms of the consulting industry, they're found in wastewater and because of that several regulatory agencies are dealing with, some would say struggling with, setting appropriate discharge limits for wastewater containing PFAS, considering that not only does the liquid that's discharged itself maybe under a, a NIPTES permit or a state permit, but also the solids that are separated in the wastewater treatment train can contain concentrations of these compounds which may be actionable. And Involved in that is the fact that the receiving water bodies, the surface waters, also have PFAS that can be detected widespread. Sediment is an area where these compounds are not yet strongly regulated in all areas, um, but where they are found. And then soil, at least in as much as it can be a source to groundwater, and obviously, ultimately, life, right? The, the detection of, for instance, PFOA in human blood or in breast milk has sort of driven a lot of the risk evaluation where it has occurred for these PFAS. As an example of occurrence, this map, which is from the Environmental Working Group, which seeks to sort of collect information both from state agencies and the Department of Defense, shows uh, locations in the continental U.S., they actually have it throughout the U.S. and U.S. territories where PFAS has been detected. Now, these are classified in this case just by the type of site, whether it was a drinking water detection that was made, you know, available in a consumer confidence report or something like that, or reported by the Department of Defense as occurring on a military site. But this map shows about 2,800 um, locations where these chemicals have been found, usually due to either um, regulatorily required sampling previously under the uncontrolled contaminant rules or in some cases now due to state requirements for drinking water systems to sample their their raw and treated water streams for these compounds and then also a certain number of um, other known sites so sites that in some cases were discovered following detections in drinking water now while this map is you know meant to be current up till June of this year, um, it doesn't tell the whole story once you start digging into occurrences. As an example, um, just the state of Maine, where I'm originally from, uh, posts on their website two important and interesting maps. One of locations where PFAS has been detected either under site assessment or in drinking water, and they also uh, publish an application that shows the location of uh, the spreading of solids from wastewater treatment plants, which the state of Maine is actively investigating as a potential source of impacts to drinking water, to surface waters, in some cases even to wildlife. Mm -hmm. And as you can see here, there's, there's quite a few more sites the state individually is tracking compared to what were reported by, by EWG. So they're widespread and with the regulatory focus um, being discovered more and more places more and more often, frankly. So ultimately, regulatorily, usually the idea is that we're concerned about the effects on human health, safety, or the environment. And there have been some studies on potential impacts, impacts of PFAS to, to life. And some of the potential effects that have been found include effects to the liver. Um, there is a published study about decreased immunological response following vaccines that was specifically looking at PFOA, so the 8-carbon carboxylate. 
there's also been potential uh, effects to exposure or con concentrations in the blood, development reproductive effects, potential endocrine disruption, not necessarily by the PFAS that we're looking at here, but by other compounds in the larger family. And then one particular PFOS, PFOA, again, the, the eight carbon carboxylate, um, there is some indication that it has uh, human carcinogenic properties. So with the documented potential for human health effects and the fact that these compounds are in many media detectable to relatively low levels with modern analytical methods, and the fact that risks are still being evaluated, a lot of states um, are looking at wide, wide ranges of action levels, standards, criteria, however, however they individually term them. Um, there's an excellent and pretty up-to-date summary of those criteria kept by ITRC that anybody can go to their website and look at. And going through that, um, list and just calling out some some individual highlights one one thing that jumps out specifically is that due to the potential bioaccumulation effects of PFAS uh, there are orders of magnitude differences in proposed or existing surface water criteria those largely depend on whether or not the surface water body is seen as a you know, a supply for edible fish, which would potentially pose more risk of, you know, eating a creature that has accumulated PFAS at levels greater than the environment. But soil itself also has widely ranging um, criteria. For instance, for long chain um, carboxylates, Hawaii currently has an action level of, of a million milligrams per kilogram. Now that's based on the relative immobility of those longer chain PFAS in soil and a lack of, you know, documented acute or chronic health effects. At the far other extreme in soil, we have the Washington Department of Energy with a state action level for PFOA in saturated soil, you know, down at 10 to the minus 6 milligrams or four times 10 to the minus six milligrams per kilogram, specifically because of the, again, documented potential health effects of PFOA and the fact that among these compounds, it's happier to get in the groundwater than some of the others. And as I mentioned before, there's, there's ongoing activity in the discharge space. So federal and state regulations regarding discharge of treatment waters or treated waters to surface waters or as underground injection um, is, is pretty active right now. Recently, the state of New Jersey surveyed all of its wastewater treatment plant operators, public and private, um, asking them to sample their influent and affluent and potentially midfluent for uh, a subset of PFAS compounds. And now they're moving forward with trying to set standards for those compounds that won't result in all of these wastewater treatment plants having to shut down because they can't meet the discharge limits. And then most recently, we have the, the new circular designation for two PFAS, um, PFO and PFOS, as circular hazard substances uh, to which now the you know release intended or unintended of certain quantities of those two compounds would actually have to be reported. So where are we sort of in the regulatory space compared to the, the universe of PFAS that's out there? Well, as you may have picked up on by now, some compounds received early attention, both due to sources that were sort of visible and discrete, for instance, PFOS in historical firefighting foams, or again, for, for potential documented health effects like PFOA. Now, more recently, several states have promulgated um, drinking water or related groundwater, and in some cases, soil standards for sort of the next easiest set of PFAS compounds to um, 
unambiguously identify in the analytical and for which usually some other regulatory agency has put out a health advisory or, or some sort of health documentation that states can then hang their hang their regulation on and we're starting to get increased attention into a whole nother set of PFAS compounds known as fluorotelomers. Um, two of those that have um, brand names that were created as replacements for phased out PFAS, such as PFOS and PFOA, include Adona and, uh, and Gen X. Importantly for this discussion, some of these fluorotelomers appear to degrade in the environment to form other regulated PFAS compounds like PFOA. And even if you count sort of generously, that still leaves about 4,000 other PFAS compounds that could, um, that need research done on their occurrence, their risk, their fate and transport, and ultimately regulatory action levels. So as we chase these compounds through the environment in an effort to fulfill regulatory requirements in order to be protective of human health, safety, and the environment, given their chemistry, there are a few important environmental controls that often, um, that should be, should be evaluated in order to understand how and why your PFAS are going to behave as they are. The most important ones or some important ones include pH, um, moisture content, which we'll look at a little more in a little bit, is, is quite important, organic matter and clays. So if you're dealing with, again, in the subsurface, this talk is leaving apart atmosphere or transport or something like that, uh, understanding those four components of your particular site are important. Now the PFAS properties themselves more or less are sort of uh, in relation to one another, like the individual compounds to one another. For instance, many PFAS are denser than water. However, you're normally not dealing with these as a as a separate phase or something like that. So we're not that worried about density driven transport, I suppose, unless you had concentrate or something like that. Um, their physical state, many of these PFAS compounds that are regulated actually occur as um, solids in their pure form, but as soon as they're dissolved into water, they dissociate into the acid. That solubility can vary quite a bit. And there is also quite a range of vapor pressures in Henry Law's constants, but in general, um, the PFAS that we're talking about here can best be considered as sort of semi-volatile at best. Importantly, PFAS, like other surfactants, can form these micelles that we'll look at. And, and as I said before, they ultimately have low reactivity. So they don't tend to undergo chemical transformation once released, again, with the potential exception of fluorotelomers breaking down to form uh, other end members. But in the subsurface, interfaces are very important. Um, these little cartoons are just of PFOS molecules in different states trying to illustrate some of the situations that are going to affect how your given PFAS mixture might move in the environment. Um, due to the hydrophobicity of the tail of, of PFAS molecules, the water-air interface becomes important and the percent saturation or the amount of water that you're actually dealing with in the subsurface can exert a strong effect in terms of mobility. Essentially with less water, these are less mobile. They, they tend to stick at the air water interface as much as possible. The water and soil, because of the polar nature of these compounds, again those, those functional ends, those heads tend to be negatively charged. They can be attracted to positively charged um, mineral surfaces and they tend to stay away from each other, right? They're going to orient, the PFAS molecules would prefer to orient sort of head to tail, but if you have a nice a nice clay or something like that that they can interact with, they'll orient. And again, that orientation, that active orientation and that electronegative effect will tend to slow down PFAS transport in the water. The separation of water and napples or oils more generally, I guess we could say, um, 
one interesting area of research is that unlike certain organic compounds that may preferentially partition into or out of the oil, um, PFAS will accumulate again at that interface. And so understanding the distribution of your NAPL in the subsurface becomes an important clue in towards understanding where you may find your, your PFAS compounds. And then finally, uh, depending on the PFAS compound, the um, partitioning coefficient to organic carbon can be, can be quite high. So high concentrations of organic carbon tends to retard their transport through the environment because other than the very short chain PFAS, so four and five and six chain, depending on sulfonates or carboxylates, they would, they would like to stick with the carbon. And then finally, we have this micelle formation, which occurs in very high concentrations, where essentially you have more PFAS compound than you do water, which, which wouldn't be the normal situation um, in a release, like a fugitive release from firefighting foam or from atmospheric deposition, um, but could in theory be important if you were, had literally spilled concentrate. And so what happens with these micelles, you may know, is that the PFAS molecules or their surfactant molecules in general orient themselves around very small bodies of water essentially and they isolate the water from itself and form these these droplets um, that can behave more like colloids in the formation rather than dissolved phase. So in the subsurface your primary variables for determining how retarded, how much slower the PFAS may move than the groundwater itself. The first is, are you short chain or long chain? And are you um, sulfonic or, or carboxylate? The degree of water saturation, which again, if, if the release has occurred above the water table, there can be a very strong effect sort of slowing the transport down to the water table depending on the thickness of your of your capillary zone and whether or not you have napples. If, if napples are suspected in the subsurface, whether D-napples or L-napples, um, the interface between them in the water can be areas where you have increased PFAS concentration. Now, certain types of PFAS, which have positively charged functional ends or ends that can essentially switch charge this Zwitter ionic, they tend to sorb more than the straight anionic PFAS, most of which are what we're talking about today. Most of the compounds that we're looking at are anionic. In general, longer chains tend to be slowed more than shorter chains. And sulfonates tend to sorb more strongly than carboxylates. So that has implications not just for fate and transport in the subsurface, but also for potential treatment options. Essentially, a, a short chain carboxylate can be quite a bit harder to get out of the water if you're trying to treat it than a longer chain sulfonate. Now just a single PFAS, uh, PFAS in this case, um, the eight carbon sulfonate, retardation factors in column studies have been found to range, you know, by about three times in the same aquifer material, just depending on the degree of saturation and whether or not there's a NAPL present. And then, as I mentioned before, there are some transformations that may be important. So one of the important ones um, is, again, that, that some historically used long chain PFAS like OS and OA were initially in some applications replaced by shorter chains, so six or five carbon compounds. And then in many cases, ultimately by these fluorotelomer compounds. And Research has shown that there can be transformation from those fluorotelomers. In this case, what we're showing is a couple of sets of chains that end up in both cases causing the formation of PFOA. So you released a fluorotelomer or some other precursor originally that had zero PFOA in it, but through a series of either biotic or abiotic transformations, you can accumulate PFOA in the subsurface as well potentially as other as other um, shorter stable compounds. Now all of this 
the difference in retardation factors, the potential for precursor transformation can result in a chromatographic effect. So a, a release of a mixed PFAS substance, um, again, whether that's a foam or um, a manufacturing component or the adjunct to a manufacturing component, once it gets into the subsurface starts to, can start to separate. And often what we see is that short chain compounds and carboxylates from the same release move further faster than longer chain or sulfonate containing compounds. In some cases that can be difficult to separate from additional potential sources. We'll talk about background in just a minute. But it's important to keep in mind that they can result from the same release. Some recent work looking at the relative abundance of regulated PFAS in groundwater over um, a distance of transport have sort of helped shore up the idea that you may be able to to track things back towards a source area in some cases. Now bedrock versus unconsolidated materials, there's a few studies available um, of sort of known release times for PFAS chemicals and then looking at the fate and transport in the field. And what seems to be clear from those is that one, bedrock's going to bedrock. I mean, the heterogeneity of the fractures versus the solid matrix affects flow rates and directions for all compounds, not just PFAS. Bedrock susceptibility to PFAS may be important in that the, the normal sorts of um, pollution susceptibility concerns of depth to bedrock, type of bedrock, uh, hydraulic conductivity of the overburden may make releases into bedrock more possible for PFAS, just as it would for any other contaminant. And maybe not surprising, given their love of interfaces, um, dual porosity mass transfer effects appear to be important. So the idea that PFAS would both be potentially susceptible to being slowed in their transport due to um, the matrix itself, but also the idea that dead end pore spaces or immobile water that can be a sink for PFAS that's been released over time to accumulate through diffusion, then acts as a source over a longer time, even after uh, PFAS in the main flow pass and the fractures and such has ended. So again, not, not a huge surprise given what we've seen with other um, contaminant fate and transport scenarios in bedrock, the same applies here. So when we're working to evaluate fate and transport, sort of keeping all that in mind, trying to think how we, how we get our hands around this stuff better in the field or on the project, I think we need to keep some important things in mind. One is the source. So different PFAS sources have different distribution patterns. They have different composition, um, and they essentially release these compounds into the environment differently. Fire training or other aqueous film forming foam applications can cause overspray, which may be an important um, parameter in how big your spill is in terms of what area is covered, as opposed to industrial or manufacturing, which may have air stack emissions or wastewater emissions versus landfills, which may be sort of a, essentially in the environment a point source of a of a wide mix of PFAS compounds. And then wastewater treatment, again, by itself, I think is worth emphasizing that you can have your, your point discharge of your wastewater that contains these compounds, but you can also have treatments that result in airborne deposition and certainly the movement of solids or biosolids to off-site locations is an important mechanism by which PFAS gets out into the bigger world. So understanding those release mechanisms can help in understanding what you're going to come up to. Similarly, the environment itself, what do you have for interfaces? Are we talking about saturated or unsaturated, fine grain or coarse grain sediments? Do you have napples? And getting your hand around the soil pH composition, organic carbon up front is critical for forming a good conceptual site model of where your PFAS will go.
Potential correlations that have been seen in the field include changes in pH, changes in ammonia, alkalinity, conductivity, uh, total or dissolved organic carbon in water samples. And, and in one study, uh, potential correlations with um, concentrations of dissolved and total metals in groundwater. There's some interferences with being able to do PFAS site assessment work effectively and efficiently. Um, they're still developing proper analytical methods, especially for media other than drinking water. Uh, EPA method 1663 came out recently. Um, and QAQC and data validation, especially with commercial high throughput labs, can be a challenge. For one thing, um, we can have difficulties with retention um, in the analysis, especially of the sorter chain, PFAS. Uh, we're doing better with um, interferences from non-targeted analytes, at least for the analytical lists that are available. And sometimes just the, the nature of the sample itself can be problematic. We may have multiple sources. We have noise in the environment. We'll talk a little bit about where that comes from. Um, especially again in the form of precursors and understanding whether or not precursors may exist at your site and whether they're affecting what you're seeing. As an example, there was a recent study in 2019 looking at how uh, PFAS depositional rates potential sort of worldwide into soil. So these numbers were developed off of some background studies that were done away from source areas and um, statistically treated to determine that there wasn't some undiagnosed source area so that the, the resulting estimate became what's falling out of the sky essentially and they grouped them by different chain lengths and we can see that some of the regulatorily important C PFAS, these C678s which in many jurisdictions have regulations are again raining out of the sky into surface soil and Washington and all's opinion was that these may likely be the result of chlorotelomer production. And even though that is now being curbed, this sort of decay chain to get down to PFOA, for instance, this C8 and PFOS, um, may continue for decades. Similarly, direct manufacturing um, emissions may leave background concentrations. Now, this is a study also by Washington, in this case in Jersey, looking at um, basically non-regulated PFAS compounds and how much there may be in certain source areas. Now, the thing to keep in mind with this is while, while these were unregulated um, compounds being emitted due to a manufacturing process, these are coming in this case from plants that previously manufactured the PFAS. AS that we're that we are regulated on and so it sort of serves to show that you could have detectable levels due to atmospheric fallout from manufacturing operations that cover a wide area and while your site may be concerned with potential landfill leachate in a drinking water well or uh, historic PFOS or, or, or C6 sulfonate impacts from a firefighting event you may pick up other stuff um, due to this atmospheric fallout. Now sampling considerations are important with PFAS. Um, there's been some work done on determining whether certain um, sampling equipment is compatible or not compatible with PFAS sampling. We'll look at that in just a second. Um, but there are a lot of materials out there manufactured over time that could come into contact with samples and affect your results. One thing to keep in mind is that you need to do equipment blanks. Um, understanding, not just based on a, on a lab certificate from a manufacturer, but understanding what your equipment looks like in contact with your water, in this case, is, is very important. Um, anybody who's working in this space as a consultant needs to develop some standard of care in an SOP to minimize those contacts. And those things that are known to contain or be manufactured with PFAS like Teflon is that's that's still advised. So there are some stay away compounds when we're talking about environmental sampling shown in the red here. This is based on um, Field et al's 
report last year, I believe it was. Um, some of these are relatively common in our industry. For instance, uh, low density polyethylene is sometimes used, whether it should be or not, for instance, in low flow sampling, or if you're sampling water supplies or systems, um, pipe thread compounds and tapes can have essentially unknown and possibly high concentrations of PFAS compounds. The way to handle that in the field is to make sure that you get all the necessary QA samples, uh, field reagent blanks, source water blanks. We've had source water that was certified PFAS free from the lab result in PFAS detections. We've had fire hydrants result in PFAS detections. Um, collecting an equipment rinse sample if as appropriate for, for soil or sediment type samples. Getting a field duplicate and performance evaluations by the lab that are associated with your sample round. So with your samples, whenever possible, obtaining a matrix spike and duplicate and a lab spike and duplicate um, with your samples is, is critical to understanding basically how well the lab is doing. Now, in terms of remediating PFAS, um, there are several approaches, especially for water, um, ranging from good old carbon to reductive defluorination. I don't claim to be an expert in any of these. Um, again, ITRC has some good guidance on basic characteristics, and I'm sure that if you reach out, there's a thousand vendors who would like to sell you most of them. In soils, uh, it's a little more limited for a couple of reasons. One, oftentimes the scope of impacts uh, may result in immobilization, some sort of additive or adjunct or covering of soil being the best way to limit uh, impacts to groundwater. There's always excavation, disposal, and landfill, but then leachate potentially has to be considered and more and more disposal facilities are asking for PFAS analysis. Um, incineration is a proven way to destroy PFAS, but permitting for those facilities has become a little difficult. And one of the most uh, interesting ones, and we're actually looking at this at some locations, is the idea of doing solid impaction. So essentially ball mills um, physically churning soil with steel balls between the heat generated and the sort of kinetic energy transferred seems to reduce PFAS pretty substantially in soil. Looking more broadly, continued research and focus on the health effects. Again, a very small number of PFAS compounds have been fully evaluated. The idea of rapid field tests, the ability to detect PFAS at actionable levels in field media without sending to the lab is an area of active research. Fate and transport in solid waste settings. So, so how do PFAS get out of landfills and into leachate and then into the environment? And I think one that's certainly of concern among uh, you know industry that may be responsible for cleaning this stuff up is the cost implications of PFAS management. So how do you effectively, safely, and efficiently deal with PFAS generated wastes? And then there's also the identification, sort of the bottom of the triangle that I showed earlier of all the other PFAS compounds. How can we reliably um, identify, det detect and identify these compounds in analytical samples? And there's a couple of, of interesting sort of thrusts in that way. One is uh, there is machine learning for different sources. So trying to isolate from a given set of samples, whether it, in this case it was an AFFF or non AFFF related source and being able to process that data at scale. And then also automated data processing uh, to attempt to identify individual PFAS compounds from a library that folks you know, build as they go on. So with that, I would say thank you. There's my contact information if you want to give me grief afterwards. And before we take any questions, I would just put up some of the references that I found useful over the years looking at these things. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Nate. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, very, very nice uh, broad coverage of the PFAS issue. Um, there are a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, from, from Brian Redman, um, is, the, is the fluorine substitution on the, on the alcohol uh, chain always complete, or could there perhaps be some hydrogen still left? And if so, how would that change the properties of the compound? I, I think by definition, 
that that would make them polyfluoroalkanated, right? So all the locations do not have a fluorine that could, and I would have to assume it would change the chemical properties of the compound, and I don't think I could answer exactly how right now, to be honest, Brian. Thanks, Nate. And Brian was also mentioning that the uh, so the reference you made to the Hawaii standard um, was was a million milligrams to kilogram, which is really a kilogram to kilogram. So I, I don't know if that was a typo or they're they're still figuring things out. I'm not sure. No, I think I think it's essentially became a you could have pure um, long chain stuff in the soil, but because again because of the um, tendency for it not to get into groundwater hawaii doesn't see it as a risk i mean i can't i can't speak for how they came up with that number okay but you also recognize that it's been a, a little bit odd so that's oh yeah 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 but, but it's there to show you the range i mean it's again it, the the idea of the detectability versus the risk i think is a very active part of this and it's an important thing to keep in mind that um for instance, we've had regulators who have essentially said, you know, you will get to zero in soil on the basis of what risk to groundwater or what risk to a receptor. They couldn't really, <laughs> couldn't really tell us. They're just using that as a placeholder. Great. Thank you. And then uh, Brent Jones, I'm not sure if you know him from, he's also involved with, with ITRC. And he's uh, referring to some work by, by a person named uh, Nickerson and, and asking if um, if there's a good understanding of the chemical analytical methods and the extract not getting at the micelle, or is there, there's, there's winter ionic attractions and that the method could be missing as much as 97% of what's actually present? I can't speak to that offhand Brent I'd be happy to follow up with you and understand um where you're going with it um I don't want to evade I just I just don't know or if you want to expand on it now I guess that'd be it's up to you Mark yeah Brent you're more than welcome to add another comment there I'll just keep working down the list Brian Brian Redman came back and also asked could, could incineration of PFAS generate you know, you're talking about it in, in the air, you're talking about it in the, in the water air interface in the soil, but could the incineration, obviously of PFAS generate again undesirable air pollutants? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that there has been much work directly on like byproducts from the incineration process for, for PFAS. I do know that there was a facility in New York State that was taking PFAS impacted media and attempting to incinerate it and their destruction efficiency wasn't quite where it needed to be and they were asked to stop providing that service all right thank you and then miranda menzies asks uh, what progress is being made in eliminating these compounds i mean there's a lot of them but these compounds are consumer contact products uh, such as clothes yeah that's that's again one of of sort of I don't want to say fraught, but it, it, it's very it's very active in that way. Um, again, because there are so many of these chemicals, and because they have a lot of use, um, I think that's a big hill to climb. I know that there have been certain efforts for particular compounds like PFOA to take that out of the manufacturing process. Um, but I can't really speak to who'd, who'd be responsible for that, I guess, and, and say it that way. I mean, let me put it this way. Like, I think twice before putting Scarch Guard on my rain jacket. Um, but I think that in most cases, it seems evident, again, that they are pretty ubiquitous. And one of the things that we wrestle with, even from an assessment and remediation standpoint, is separating out what is PFAS in the environment due to a release, you know, that somebody is directly responsible for versus what's falling out of the sky or what's in the surface water, that sort of thing. Great, thank you. Yep. Um, Miranda also asked, uh, sort of rely 
the key word there. What is the current detection limit of some of these constituents in the water? Clean, clean, clean water, you're down to sub part per trillion. So less than nanograms per gram. Um, but that is fraught with all the normal matrix effects and that's not uniform for all the compounds. Again, the we tend to see the labs I work with tend to run somewhere between 12 up to about 70 PFAS type compounds. And the reliable detection limits for many of those are sort of the mid range regulated compounds. When you get very short or very long, we find that recovery is not great. Um, again, they don't tend to have a lot of interferences. So it's not that you confuse one compound for another, but your detection limit may have to be raised or you may have to um, qualify you know, every sample in a batch because the PFBA recovery was, was below. Okay, and then just going back to Brent, I, I misspoke, and, and he, uh, he he's indicating with your experience and uh, support with ITRC. Oh, uh, oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, yeah, and, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, so that that's what he was saying there, and that the, the concern is that the current EPA approved methods, some of, of what you yeah. just referred to, aren't aren't really good enough to get the mass balance and more. The, the methods are 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 still getting. Um, focused primarily yep. maybe on the, on the precursor content yep so so we do have we do have we have i guess i'd say we have seen a change in attitude among some regulators and some clients with the use of total organic fluorine or precursor or pidgey these assays that seek to basically account for essentially all the organic fluorine in a sample, not just the few compounds that may be regulated. Now that has been sort of a sort of a back and forth, I'd say, because on one end, for instance, if I have a client who is assessing and we are able to develop a robust conceptual site model that accounts for what we're seeing of these individual compounds, they don't necessarily want to go and we don't necessarily want to recommend looking at well let's look at all the organic fluorine in the sample and see if we can account for total load now that has started to shift because they don't have regulatory limits and because different labs do all of those analyses differently they have begun to shift in some cases for remediation where everybody is sort of getting on board with the idea that you need to understand all that is coming into your destruction train in order to make sure that you can treat everything in the destruction train without making a bunch of other compounds that you don't want coming out of the other end. But until until labs come back with a, uh, a an industry standard mechanism or, or analytical method to get at that total fluorine and total precursor number, I think it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. Okay. And then, uh, uh, yep. Uh, Bill, Bill Motzer is asking, are you aware of any forensic investigations uh, for source identification of PFOS involving sulfur stable isotopes? I'm not Bill, but if you are, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> I am aware of forensic investigations and, and forensic approaches for different kinds of PFOS. Um, but not using, not using stable isotope sulfurs, but that could be, that could be interesting again for anything in the, in that sulfonate range. And that becomes a secondary thing actually that, that is sort of interesting, which is, you know, there are compounds such as PFOS that were sort of phased out of manufacturing, but that doesn't mean that in all cases they were taken away you know they still exist out there they're still useful products with a long shelf life and and sometimes people you know use new old stock when they um when they do things now and so that can be a real a real complication in understanding whence this stuff comes from and and because of that and, and because everybody wants to be able to determine liability you know the idea of one building pfas fingerprint libraries sampling old and new materials and building those 
those libraries of understanding around this is a very it's a very hot hot topic really trying to, to, to nail down in other words the responsible party yeah. Every, everybody wants to be able to explain somebody else yeah yeah and, and in reality they, they could be coming from a lot of different sources you could have airborne and, and, yep. and groundwater and, and other things so understood there Lori Lowe's asking is there is there any, you know are there any changes that that will be occurring with land applications with biosolids from biosolid companies I think so I can tell you for a fact that there are changes now in permitting requirements with what states will allow to be spread um, without, um, you know, without that. The, I do think that we are starting to see more concern from the disposal end. I would assume that if your if your job is you know, getting solids out of a wastewater treatment plant for a fixed price or something you may not want to move first. Um, but as I say, like, for instance, in the state of Maine, 30 years of properly permitting and spreading biosolids has resulted in kind of a mess up there in a lot of locations where they now have to go back and locate the stuff because it is in um in everything i mean it's it's in the soil it's in water it's in animals they, they had detections of pfas compounds in the blood of white-tailed deer they had it in dairy cows um it, it was a big it was a big deal and like i say and they're still working to get their hands around it so i i do think that part of that is sort of hung up in this regulatory limbo of if it's all over the place where do the regulators stop regulating when where do they say is we're not getting below this number and then they can start to permit and direct um, folks like biosolid you know transporters and, and disposers whoops sorry great and one last question again from miranda uh, sort of range or typical average cost for pfos and pfoa uh, analytical in uh, in water in groundwater I don't know offhand, Miranda, but I'd be happy to get you some pricing. I mean, I'm not a lab, but I can tell you tell you what it looks at for us. The the two big things that seem to drive, well, the three big things that seem to drive pricing is some of the largest commercial labs are running out of capacity to analyze PFAS samples in a timely manner. Um, Sometimes that still becomes an issue with smaller labs if they're actually subbing out their analysis. The second thing that drives it really is the um, uh, is the is the matrix that you want to sample. And I know you you know you've got water here, but you know wa water can vary obviously from from clean filtered drinking water samples all the way to what came out of the excavation that day, and that can drive pricing. Um, but really, really, the biggest thing has been has been capacity and and labs sort of pre-existing contractual obligations to to deal with stuff. Great, it takes us right to the top of the hour. Um, I'll check in here with Donna and or Wendy. Did, did either one of you have any uh, AIPG announcements that, that you wanted to just shout out here before we finish the call? Thank, first of all, thank you so much, Nate. That was great. And thank you, Mark, for uh, moderating today. There is another um, webinar coming up this week, and I believe that one has CEU credits associated with it. It's an um, economic geology webinar tomorrow, the, 20, the 27th of September. So if anybody's interested, just, just check your emails for uh, the details. There is a small cost associated with that one. And, and Nate, um, echoing uh, Don's first statement there, thanks so much uh, for taking the time to put this together. There are some folks wondering if, uh, if, if this will be shared. Um, the recording will be, but if there's any chance that uh, you're willing to share uh, the slide deck. I can check. I don't think there's any issue with that. Feel free to email okay. me directly. Great. And maybe put that in the PDF. Um, so it doesn't get changed or edited or whatever. And stuff. Yep. Power. 
whatever you're comfortable with. Again, thank you so much. Uh, great presentation. There's so much to cover there. And uh, I think you did a great job from both in the directory level and getting into some of the some of the details at a great level. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great thank rest you. of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.